bless you and allow me to be here. And I've enjoyed the program tonight, and I know you have. And I wanted to uh, just give a word or two testimony um, about the Bible in light of Christian education. I know that this, I think this is your school verse, and it was our school verse when I pastored in Luke uh, 2.52. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Uh, and that's the definition of a proper education. He increased in wisdom. Of course, that's mentally and, and uh, uh, in uh, wisdom, stature. Then he increased in wisdom and stature. That's physically. And, of course, we believe that ought to happen. And uh, then he increased in favor with God. And uh, the right kind of education will bring us in favor with God. Uh, and, then, and then it says in favor with man. That's socially. And so uh, as in the, everything else in the Christian life, Jesus Christ is a pattern uh, for uh, our Christian lives. And uh, I got a burden in 1973 to start our Christian school in Milford, Ohio. And um, I did it because they put the, the Bible out of the school. And to educate a person without the Bible is just like shining brass on a sinking ship. It's not possible. Um, and I... And I and, uh, I gave I given my life to getting people to have a Bible in their home and in their lives. We started a ministry called uh, Bearing Precious Seed, and the goal of that ministry is to get people the Bible where there's a shortage of Bibles. Uh, <clears throat> and then we started a ministry called First Bible International, which is a ministry designed to get the Bible where. Uh, it isn't yet, and so we have those two, uh, that uh, two ministries, and, and then uh, I took it personal when the Supreme Court uh, it took the Bible out of school when I'm trying to give my life to getting the Bible into the hands of people, and uh, so we started those ministries, and uh, God God blessed in a, a, a wonderful way. I, I, I discovered that uh, the, the Christian school movement and the uh, uh, public school is kind of undoing uh, what uh, the pastor and the church and the parent is trying to do. And uh, so uh, I thought what we need to do is, is, get the, uh, is get the Bible back into the schools. I was in Mongolia with my Bible ministry. Um, some time back, way back, 1973, and uh, I met the president of Mongolia, who was a graduate of Harvard, uh, and uh, he, was a, he was a Hindu, and uh, I, I, I told him, I said, I'm going to come to Mongolia and give uh, uh, your people the word of God in their language. And he, I explained all what all that meant, and uh, after I got done explaining it, he said to me, well, Brother Keen, or he called me Dr. Keen, he said, Dr. Keen, we want you to come and uh, put the Bible into Mongolia. And he said, uh, we'll help you do that, and I'll run before you and prepare the way. And so we uh, went to Mongolia and and have been working there now to get the, get the Bible into Mongolia. But that, what I want to tell you is this. He said to me after, after a lunch and a meal and after some discussion, he said, you know, uh, Dr. King, I'm a graduate of Yale or Harvard. I really forget which one. He said, I'm a graduate, and so I have read the New Testament through. He said, I'm also um, uh, the president of... Uh, Mongolia, and, and I led a rebellion against communism in uh, 1986, I think he said, and uh, uh, we're trying to make Mongolia a democracy. 
And then he said the most enlightening thing to me that I, 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 I never forgot it. He said, we, we know that you cannot have democracy without the Bible. Now here's a pagan, a Hindu. You know what I think? I think we ought to listen to him. And we're taking the Bible out of the schools while even pagan people are seeing the value of, of putting it back into the schools. Amen. It looks to me like if we would just look at what's happened since we've taken the Bible out of the school, that we'd want it, we'd want it back in the school. And, but it's never going to happen, I know that. But uh, look, at, look at all uh, the, the uh, problems we've had since we took the, the Bible out of the school. All the murders and all the uh, immoralities and all the error. Uh, and so uh, they're trying to stop all that in our schools. I'll tell you how to stop that in the school. Uh, put it back in what we took out that allowed it. Thank you, Brother Keene. Uh, but uh, I, I'm not here to bring a bell about that. I'm here to say thank God for parents um, who has a vision Amen. to put your kids in Christian school. This is a full service bank. You know what a full service bank is? It's a bank that you can't have a need they can't take care of if you pay enough for it. Uh, and this church and churches like this one are full service churches and taking care of the needs of the Christian education of your people. Uh, you know, the one thing I never did like to hear a, a young person say, a Christian young person, that I'm glad my Mom and Dad loved me enough uh, to put me in a Christian school, as if other kids that Mom and Dad didn't love them enough to. It isn't a matter of love. It's a matter of vision. It's a matter of uh, it's a matter of maybe economics. It's not that we don't they don't love their kids as much as you love yours, but God has given you insight. And I thank God for that. And uh, you know I've traveled around the world, uh, and. Uh, <clears throat> I've noticed a common denominator in paganism. You know, every pagan tribe has two or three things. One, they all have a cemetery. The reason is people die in all over the world. And the wages of sin is death. So they always have a cemetery. They always have an altar. Every pagan tribe I've ever been in, and I think every, tri every pagan tribe in the world has an altar. You know why they have an altar? Because they know that the great spirit somewhere up there is angry. And we try to buy him off. We know that when the father saw the son, uh, he was satisfied. And we know our God has accepted us. And, uh, and uh, we don't have to try to buy him off. And every pagan, every pagan tribe has high poverty rates. The reason for that is whatever whatever they have, they, they have to spend on their altar trying to keep their God happy. Uh, and yet we Christians, we, we know that Jesus died on the cross to answer all the demands that God put upon us. Jesus paid the price. He paid it all. And so we're glad about that. But the pagan doesn't have that information. And... Uh, <clears throat> And I say this, the Christian school is not a cure-all, not a, it don't take care of everything. Uh, I, I think we still need Christian homes and helping the church and the church helping the school that uh, people can profit from both. Uh, I, didn't ha I didn't have the privilege of a Christian education. Back when I was growing up, there was no such thing as a Christian school. And I probably wouldn't have went if there was. But now these kids, all this we've seen tonight, has certainly uh, been a blessing, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm sure you appreciate it. So I'm trying to undo, I'm trying to correct an error, uh, an error in this world. And while I'm trying to correct it, America is, is undoing it. I'm trying to get a, the Bible back available to people and get, get the Bible back in the homes and schools and, and uh, whatever. And so I trust that you'll appreciate that. And uh, Jesus, uh, he increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Amen. 
And that's the goal of our school. Thank God for you parents. I hope you kids are appreciative of the sacrifice they're making. I know you are. Now I thank God for tenure and for a testimony. People who do the right thing the right way for the right reason for a long time. And uh, thank you very much, Brother Keene. Very insightful, very helpful. And I appreciate so very much that thought tonight. I'm going to ask our church family if you would consider reading uh, Luke chapter number 1 between now and Sunday morning, and especially uh, verse number 36 through the end of the chapter. I want to speak on that on Sunday morning. We're going to talk about the power and the importance of a name. And we've been studying the book of Luke and talking about that uh, God uh, gave two parents, Zacharias and Elizabeth, and Mary and Joseph, and they didn't get to pick the names of their children. Their names were chosen by the Lord, John and Jesus. And it was names, and there's an importance in the name. I want to just say real quickly in preparation for Sunday, young people, your name is important. When we say your name, we think someone who is lazy or someone who is diligent. Someone who is respectful, someone who is disrespectful. Someone who listens and someone who is negligent to listen. Someone who is a spender, someone who is a saver. Someone who is frugal, and, and someone who is, uh, is a frivolous. Someone who is a giver, someone who is a taker. The Bible says a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. And young people, you not only have your name, but you have your parents' name. And you have a lifetime responsibility to honor your mom and your dad. My dad has now lived with God longer than he lived in my life. I was 27 years old when he passed away, and now I'm 55. So I have lived longer without him than I lived with him in my life. But I have a lifetime responsibility to honor my dad. As the Bible tells us, we're supposed to honor our parents. It's the first commandment with promise. One of the ways you do that is remembering the name that God gave you, both your first name and your last name. The Bible tells us that a good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold. If you had a pile of cash on this side of the pulpit and you have a good name here, though there may be hundreds and thousands of dollars there, Solomon, the wisest man ever lived, said, let this one stay and walk off the platform with a good name. If you could have a pile of gold and silver that could probably uh, give you lots of travel, lots of uh, choices, and over here, and then you have loving favor over here, favor of God, a good name and loving favor will far outlast gold and silver and a pile of cash. A name is very important. God's given you a name. And I want to encourage you to remember that your name is important. Not only represents you, it represents the Lord, your life, but it represents your family. And on a day that we honor and recognize Hammond Baptist Schools, I want to remind our students, the reason we have a school is for students. <laughs> and uh, students that have a name, and a name that should bring glory to the Lord Jesus Christ, and first and foremost, and I pray that you'll do that. Before I close tonight, I do not know everyone in my audience, but if there's someone here tonight and you're not sure if you died, that you'd go to heaven. That's so important to know. And to go to heaven, you must know a name. The Bible says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In Acts chapter 4, verse number 12, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any others, for there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. If you're six, you're 60, you're a grandma, you're a mom, you're a dad, but you're here tonight and you're not sure if you have eternal life. It doesn't matter if I think you're saved. It doesn't matter if your mom or your dad or your friends. It doesn't matter if you're a good person or not such a good person. What matters is, have you called and believed on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and have you called upon him? Only through Jesus we can have eternal life. If you're here tonight and you're not sure if you were to die, you go to heaven. It's not hard to go to heaven. 
Because God does 100% of the work. He's the one who loved us. He's the one who, who um, sent his son to die so we could live. We must understand three things. Number one, we're a sinner. We can't save ourselves. On the best day of our life, we still do things. We say things. We think things that are wrong and downright wicked. We're sinners. And sinners cannot prance into the presence of God and say, oh, here's why you should take me, because I'm not as bad as someone else. No. All of us have sinned, and we all come short of the glory of God. The second thing the Bible tells us is that sin has a penalty. And the penalty of sin is death. Sometimes I wish the penalty of sin was baptism. Then I would just get everybody I could to go through the ritual of baptism. That's not the penalty of sin. Sometimes I wish the penalty of sin was being a good person. Being a good person is not the payment of sin. The, 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 maybe the, the penalty of sin was, uh, was helping people, but that's not the penalty of sin. The penalty of sin is Jesus died so we could live. And death is twofold in the Bible. It's physical and it's spiritual. All of us are going to die physically one day. I have a funeral tomorrow afternoon. I just found about today, 4.30 tomorrow afternoon. There are funerals planned, and I'll tell you about them in just a few moments in our service. That means someone has been separated from their loved ones, and they're going to gather together, not necessarily for the dead, but for the living. But there's a second death, and that's to be separated from God forever in the lake of fire. Anyone who's ever separated from God forever, it's against God's will. He didn't want that to happen. But because uh, he's not willing that any would perish or die the second time, but that all would come to repentance. A change of mind, a change of understanding, a change of direction regarding eternal life. We're sinners, we deserve hell. That's the price of sin. But Jesus loves us, and on the cross, he did all that was needed to be done so we could accept and receive the gift of eternal life. Let me just remind you, eternal life is not a reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. We must understand our guilt, and we know that we need the righteousness of Jesus, and only his righteousness can give us eternal life. And then we must believe here and receive. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth, the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine heart that God hath raised Jesus from the dead, then you can be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made into salvation. If you're here tonight and you're not sure that you have eternal life, I want to give you a chance to accept the Lord. 